There's a lady in a dirty nightgown that I see in my dreams. She's standing in front of my mom's bed. Welcome to the cabin. Fears. What was it you said? The cabin. In 1971, Rhode Island, Ed and Lorraine Warren battle unseen forces in the Perron family's haunted farmhouse. This is what happened. Ed and Lorraine Warren investigated hundreds of suspected hauntings. James Wan, the master of fright, decided to put them under the spotlight that enter the Conjuring franchise now on its third main movie. But let's jump into the Wayback Machine to 2013, when the first movie introduced the Warrens as encounter with the Warrens in the movie is during the infamous Annabelle haunting. Remember that creepy doll that probably gave a few of you sleepless nights? That's the one. Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga bring Ed and Lorraine to life on the screen as they're summoned to investigate a doll that seems to be having a bit too much fun at the expense of three people. They conclude the case with a priestly house cleansing and the doll is locked away, presumably in a maximum security toy box. Despite their uncanny knack for dealing with all things spooky, the real Warrens never accepted any payment for their ghostly gigs. They paid their bills by giving lectures around the country, which probably made for some very interesting discussion points. It's also worth noting that they did investigate a haunting involving a doll possessed by the spirit of a young child. But the real-life doll was a Raggedy Ann plushie, not the ceramic Chucky-inspired horror show we see in the movie. But first welcome to the intriguing world of The Conjuring. The making of this chilling horror film was a journey filled with secrets, mysteries, and spine-tingling moments. Let's delve into the behind-the-scenes story that brought this supernatural tale to life. Ed is the only non-ordained demonologist recognized by the Catholic Church. However, the Church hasn't exactly been forthcoming with any documents to back this up. The same goes for Lorraine's clairvoyance. Despite having proved her abilities on occasion, it's impossible to officially certify such talents. Not even Hogwarts has that kind of accreditation program. One of the key aspects of The Conjuring and its sequels is the loving relationship between Ed and Lorraine. We get glimpses of their romantic history, with Lorraine firmly believing that their union was divinely orchestrated. The real-life Lorraine held this belief as well. According to The Demonologist, a book by Gerald Brittle, the couple fell in love when they were just teenagers. Ed enlisted in the Navy to fight in World War II, and after a near-death experience, he took it as a sign to marry Lorraine as soon as he returned. They remained together and took it as a sign to marry Lorraine as soon as he returned. They remained together until Ed's death 60 years later. Now that's a love story that could give Nicholas Sparks a run for his money. The Warrens did have a daughter named Judy, but she would have been in her mid-twenties at the time of the movie's investigation, and not the child we see on screen. The movie gives us sneak peeks into the Warrens' occult room, a veritable treasure trove of creepy artifacts. The real Ed and Lorraine operated a small, unofficial occult museum out of their house in Monroe, Connecticut. Many of the objects in this room have reportedly had catastrophic effects on people. The museum, while no longer open, was still operational just a few years ago before Lorraine passed away in 2019. It housed a number of allegedly haunted artifacts. This wasn't just a room filled with Halloween decorations. This was the real deal. The heart of the conjuring is the unfortunate Perrin family, who were the victims of the haunting that supposedly took place at the old Arnold estate in Harrisville, Rhode Island. This was no ordinary house. It was a 200-acre property that was established in 1736, respectively. While the house in the movie was a set, the real house is still standing, albeit somewhat smaller than its cinematic counterpart. The real estate also had a barn, which according to Andrea Perrin was Paranormal Activity Central. The house was large enough to accommodate the sizable Perrin family, which consisted of Roger, Carolyn, and their five daughters, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cindy, and April. Roger Perrin was a traveling salesman, not the truck driver he's portrayed as in the movie, but he was often away from home. Not long after they moved in, the girls began experiencing paranormal activity. The real-life Roger was more skeptical about these events, probably because he was usually away and missed all the ghostly goings-on. Now let's bring in the good old music box. In the movie April, the youngest of the Perrin clan, 
stumbles upon this antique piece. It was an actual artifact showcased in the Warren's Occult Museum, though the film might have taken a few creative liberties to spice up its role in the haunting. Things start getting real when the family unearths the entrance to the farmhouse cellar. The following morning, Carolyn, the matriarch, finds herself covered in bruises. Initially, they blame it on an iron deficiency, but as the plot thickens, it's revealed that an evil spirit is behind this, gradually weakening Carolyn to make possession easier. While the movie might have added the bruise bit for dramatic effect, Andrea Perrin, the oldest daughter, stated that the spirits in the house would drain her mother's energy, making her look as if she was wasting away. In Carolyn's words, the family started to absorb the karma of the house almost as through osmosis. Odd occurrences continue with their clock stopping at 3.07 every morning and a pervasive smell of rotting meat throughout the house. Although the clock didn't actually stop at 3.07 every night, it was recorded that beds would shake every morning at 5.15 and the smell of decaying flesh was also reported by Andrea Perrin and the Warrens. Birds start crashing into the house and the haunting becomes more evident. The stench of rotting flesh intensifies. Doors start having a mind of their own, opening and closing. Sounds of children are heard prancing about the house. According to Andrea, these less threatening activities did occur. One morning, Carolyn finds April chatting away to an imaginary friend named Rory, who can supposedly be seen through the music box. In Andrea's book, she wrote about a spirit they thought was a boy named Oliver Richardson. April got so attached to the spirit that they didn't tell the Warrens about him, fearing they would banish him forever. A game of hide and clap leads Carolyn to an armoire left behind by previous occupants, but it turns out it wasn't her daughter she was following. This suspenseful sequence in the film was pure fiction, but the family reportedly did have some supernatural encounters while playing hide and seek. Christine, another daughter, encounters a menacing spirit that forcefully drags her out of bed. In the corner of the room, she sees an evil presence, but only she can see it. According to Andrea Perrin, there was a spirit that was more vicious than the others and one of the sisters woke up to the presence of a dead woman warning her to leave or face death in despair. The haunting grows more intense. One night, Carolyn is lured downstairs by the sounds of ghostly children and is locked in the cellar by the evil spirit. Andrea wakes to find Cindy sleepwalking and banging her head against the armoire with a terrifying ghost perched on top. This chilling scene is not mentioned in Andrea Perrin's account. The sleepwalking and furniture thumping were added for cinematic effect. In their wit's end, Carolyn seeks the help of the Warrens. They initially hesitate, but eventually agree. The real Warrens did investigate the events, but there's some ambiguity as to how they got involved in the Perrin haunting. In an interview with Paranormal Living TV, Andrea Perrin stated that a group of amateur paranormal investigators showed up at their house claiming Carolyn had called them which Carolyn didn't recall doing, making their presence a mystery. Regardless, they were so taken aback by what they observed that they contacted the Warrens for assistance. Andrea claimed that a family friend reached out to the Warrens on their behalf. Thus, the specifics of the initial contact remain unclear. Additionally, the Warrens didn't visit the estate until 1973, years after the parents first moved in. During their first walkthrough of the Arnold Estate, the Warrens do indeed detect signs of a dark entity. Lorraine meets Rory through April's music box and investigates the cellar, which she claims was the site of a brutal killing. She also sees an apparition hanging from the tree in the backyard, all but confirming a malicious paranormal presence. Family bought the house from a previous owner. Carolyn Perrin later said that when she contacted the previous homeowner, she was told for the sake of the children, you should leave lights on at night in the movie Carolyn mentions that all their money is tied up in the house. It wasn't until 1980 that they could afford to leave after a decade of strange happenings and emotional distress. The Warrens returned to Connecticut and began researching the estate to explore what may be causing the haunting. In her research, Lorraine Warren uncovers the home's sordid past, rife with suicide and murder. Most conspicuous is a previous resident named Bathsheba Sherman a Satan-worshipping witch who sacrificed her baby with a knitting needle before hanging herself from the backyard tree. Ed plays the recordings from earlier that day, only to discover Carolyn's voice replaced by a demon. Andrea Perrin, however, has stated that there is no verifiable proof of the haunting from recorders or cameras. Now, let's talk about Bathsheba Sherman, the alleged Satanic witch. 
In reality, she was just an average woman who lived on the property with her family. Sure, a few of her children died at very early ages, but there's no hard evidence or documentation of how they died. The rumor mill was probably working overtime back then. And guess what? Bathsheba didn't commit suicide either. She died from natural causes and was buried in a Catholic cemetery. So it's safe to say that she wasn't exactly the witchy type. I guess the church didn't mind her witchy ways that much if they gave her a Christian burial. According to Andrea Perrin's memoir, Lorraine was the first to name Bathsheba as a demonic force. The Perrin family, however, disagreed with this conclusion but decided to tolerate it. I mean, it's not every day that someone accuses your deceased neighbor of being a demonic force, right? But regardless of whether Bathsheba was a demon or not, there's no question that she was the source of some seriously malevolent activity. Maybe she just had a bad day and took it out on the Perrins. We've all been there, right? In the movie, the Warrens return to the Perrin house with their team, ready to capture all things paranormal on their recorders, cameras, and various equipment. They even have a tech guy named Drew and a local officer named Brad. But in real life, they had a larger team and a priest, but no police involvement. Can you imagine a police officer trying to catch a ghost? Talk about an interesting day at work. Andrea Perrin has mentioned that the investigation was quite the spectacle, combining technology with spirituality. I bet it was like a ghost hunting extravaganza. Lights, cameras, and some holy water for good measure. They even carried out over 10 separate investigations over a year and a half. That's dedication. I hope they had a frequent ghost hunter card to earn some rewards. In the movie, things get intense when Carolyn takes a nap and gets possessed by Bathsheba, who decides to vomit some disgusting goo in her mouth. Yuck. I guess the demon thought it was time for a little possession party. But don't worry, things get even more chaotic. Officer Brad witnesses the spirit of a woman with slit wrists, and the Warrens and the Perrins rush to his aid. But of course they get distracted when Cindy decides to set off a bunch of camera traps while sleepwalking. Oh, Cindy. Always stealing the spotlight. They follow Cindy upstairs to Andrea's room, where the door slams shut. It's like a ghostly game of hide and seek. When they finally manage to open the door, they find that Cindy has disappeared. Cue the dramatic music. But fear not, they find her inside the accursed armoire. Seriously, that thing should come with a warning label. They even discover a hidden crawl space. It's like a ghostly secret hideout. Maybe they should start charging rent for all these spirits. Lorraine, being the brave soul that she is, decides to investigate the crawl space. But the floorboards have other plans and give way, sending her plummeting through the walls of the house and down to the basement. Talk about a rough day at the office. And surprise, 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 she meets another gruesome spirit who murdered her child. It's like a haunted house tour gone wrong. Lorraine quickly realizes that Bathsheba possesses mothers in the house and forces them to kill their own children before taking their own lives. That's some heavy stuff. I guess Bathsheba didn't get the memo about sharing is caring. In the chaos of the night, Lorraine accidentally leaves behind a locket her daughter Judy gave her. Oops, I guess she was in a hurry to escape from all those ghosts, can't blame her really. And just when you thought things couldn't get any crazier, Nancy gets attacked by an invisible presence. It's like a ghostly game of tag, you're it. But let's not forget, all of this is heavily embellished for the film. While Lorraine did believe that Bathsheba had some demonic presence, the idea of possessed mothers killing their children was just based on folklore. In reality, the Warrens never left their house at any point during the lengthy investigation. I guess they preferred the comfort of their own haunted abode. It's like working from home, but with a few extra bumps in the night. Meanwhile, Lorraine, being the psychic queen that she is, receives a vision of her daughter's floating body. Talk about a chilling sight. This omen prompts the Warrens to rush back home, where their daughter Judy is having her own terrifying paranormal encounter. And guess who's involved? That's right, it's the freaky doll of the damned and Bathsheba, who apparently decided to take a detour through Lorraine's locket to reach Judy's locket. Talk about an unexpected jewelry delivery service. But fear not, because just in the nick of time, Judy's father swoops in to save the day. Forget about furniture delivery, this is a frightful flying furniture fate that no one wants to experience. Oh, but wait. Here's a plot twist for you. Turns out this attack on Judy was entirely fabricated for the movie. Yep, you heard that right. It was added to make the haunting more personal to the Warrens. I guess they wanted to up the scare factor and give their family a taste of the supernatural action. Can't blame them for wanting to spice things up a bit. 
After their thrilling encounter with the doll and the locket travel extravaganza, the Warrens decide to present their evidence to the local church in hopes of getting approval for an exorcism. But alas, the church can't sign off on it because the parents aren't Catholic. Well, I guess they didn't get the religious memo, but hold on a sec. According to Andrea Perrin, who happens to be part of the Perrin family, they were actually raised Catholic and were all baptized. So it seems like there might be a little confusion here. Later that night, Roger, the brave Perrin patriarch, informs the Warrens that Carolyn, his possessed wife, has left the motel and taken their two daughters, Christine and April. Talk about a family road trip gone wrong. Instead of waiting for Vatican approval, Lorraine, being the fierce and impulsive investigator she is, insists that they immediately leave to save the family. Who needs bureaucratic processes and red tape when there are demonic forces at play, right? The Warrens arrive at the Perrin house to find Roger in a wrestling match with Carolyn, who is wielding a pair of scissors like she's auditioning for a horror-themed hair salon. It looks like she's determined to give Christine a killer haircut. Carolyn is totally possessed at this point and the stakes are high, but fear not because Officer Brad steps in to secure Carolyn to a chair while Drew takes on the mission of finding the missing April. It's like a paranormal rescue mission with a side of hairstyling drama. With Carolyn securely fastened to the chair, the Warrens waste no time and begin the exorcism. They wrap Carolyn in a sheet, almost like they're preparing her for a demonic burrito, and start reciting the necessary passages. It's like a supernatural recipe for banishing evil. But of course, things don't go smoothly. The possessed Carolyn violently struggles, as if she's doing an intense demonic workout routine, and then she decides to showcase her levitation skills. Move over David Blaine, after some intense chasing and dodging various basement objects, Lorraine finally manages to urge the evil spirit out of Carolyn. Talk about a paranormal game of tag. And just like that, the Perrin family's agonizing nightmare comes to an end. Phew. Now let's address the elephant in the haunted room. The possession scene in the movie is certainly one of the highlights, but here's the kicker. It's also perhaps the least factual event in the entire film. The real Carolyn never demonstrated such fierce demonic behavior, and the Warrens never performed exorcisms on their own. Well, there goes our chance of witnessing some supernatural superhero action. But, hey, who needs facts when you can have a good scare, right? In conclusion, it's clear that The Conjuring took some creative liberties when it came to portraying the true events that occurred during the Perrin family haunting. While the movie provided us with a thrilling and spooky supernatural experience, it's important to remember that it veered more towards fiction than fact. The Warrens, although renowned paranormal investigators, never actually performed exorcisms on their own, and Carolyn Perrin's possession scene was a dramatic embellishment for cinematic effect. However, the real-life Perrin family did experience a haunting, and their story is still intriguing in its own right. While we may never know the full truth of what happened on the grounds of the old Arnold estate, it's clear that The Conjuring was a product of the creative minds of the screenwriters. So, if you're looking for a supernatural thriller that will keep you on the edge of your seat, The Conjuring is definitely worth a watch. And if you enjoyed this journey into the world of the paranormal, why not subscribe to The Cabin? Our channel is dedicated to exploring the unknown, diving into the mysteries of the supernatural, and sharing captivating stories just like this one. The cabin.